In this module, we're going to talk about filtering. Now, you already did filtering in the fundamentals course. You did it with the where object, or sometimes the select object, but we're really talking about the type of filtering that where object does. So in this module, we're going to talk about what early filtering is and what late filtering is. And we're going to talk about the significant performance differences that you can see between early and late filtering. So when do you filter? Let's take a look at an example. What's the difference between early and late filtering? Well, it all comes down to when the filtering is applied. For example, if you run get WMI object and pipe the results to where object, that's late filtering. You have to get all the results from get WMI object and then they get sent to where object, which has to filter them one at a time. Get child item does the same thing by default. In fact, most commandlets are designed so that you get all of the results by default and then you can pipe them to where object for later filtering. For small sets of data, it's not a, a big deal at all. For a huge set of data, though, well, it can become a huge deal in terms of time and performance. Source filtering, or early filtering, filters the result set before it's assembled and sent to you for your review. The filtering is done by whatever technology is actually assembling the result set, so it's usually faster in terms of performance, at least for big result sets. You may not even notice a difference for a smaller collection of objects. A trick to early filtering, unfortunately, is that you'll need to learn how to pass the filter criteria to the underlying technology, meaning that how you specify your filter will differ depending on exactly what you're doing. So you get a performance benefit, but you have to pay for it by having a broader skill set. So how do you go about early filtering? Well, most of the time you're going to use the dash filter parameter. Now, not every single commandlet has this parameter, but those parameters which do have it are the ones that let you do early filtering. So you're going to use the dash filter parameter and with it you're going to specify your filtering criteria. Now the exact syntax of that criteria can be a little difficult because it depends on exactly what you're filtering. See what happens is the criteria that you have on dash filter gets passed off to whatever technology is actually doing the filtering. So with get WMI object it's the remote WMI service that's doing the filtering. That's why the criteria that goes with dash filter is different. See, it doesn't need to be a PowerShell criteria. It needs to be a criteria that whatever technology is doing the filtering will understand. That's really what makes it a little bit tricky, but I'm going to show you a lot of examples so you can kind of get a feel for what some of these different things need. I'll start by changing to the program files directory since there are plenty of files and folders in there to make a good demonstration. Next, I'll run get child item, which is the commandlet underneath the dir alias, and ask it to recurse all subfolders. I'll provide it with a filter parameter, asking it to only include those files matching the pattern star.dll. This obviously takes a long time to run, but there are a couple of important points to realize. First, because this is an item commandlet, that is, it's one of the commandlets with item in its name, it's using a PS drive provider. That means the filter criteria is just passed to the PS drive provider. Some providers offer filtering, while others don't. An important thing to realize is that some providers will accept an array of patterns as the filter, not just one pattern. That means you could potentially specify several filters and see all of the items that match any of them. All right, let's move on to WMI. WMI is actually a really good example of when to use early filtering because in its case, the dash filter parameter is passed to the WMI service that is retrieving objects. With a large collection of objects, like uh, event log entries, early filtering can save a lot of time. Notice that the filter criteria here is in the format used by WMI, meaning it uses the equal sign as an equality operator, not the dash EQ operator that PowerShell uses natively. That is just something you have to get used to. Running that, you can see that only the objects matching the filter criteria were returned. That's really useful when working with remote computers because it can save a lot of transmission time and network bandwidth. Finally, let's change to the registry and run get child item there with a the filter. This time we get an error because this particular PS drive provider doesn't implement the dash filter parameter. It's unfortunate that support for dash filter isn't global but at least now you know that you won't be able to use it all of the time. Now, in addition to filtering, 
we have this concept called including and excluding in Windows PowerShell. Many command lists support these two parameters, dash include and dash exclude, and that's what actually provides a different type of filtering. Again, the syntax and the results you get will vary depending on the exact technology that's doing the filtering. Now, not all PS Drive providers are built alike, and some don't support the filter parameter. However, most of the item commandlets do support an include and exclude parameter. And rather than passing that through to the PS Drive provider so that the underlying storage technology, such as the registry or the file system, can handle the filtering, include and exclude is usually handled by the commandlet itself. The registry provider is a good example. It doesn't support the dash filter parameter, but it does support these parameters. Let's stay in the Program Files folder and try some different filtering. This time I'm going to use the Include parameter to only include those files which match the pattern I've specified. The Include parameter works slightly different than Dash Filter. Again, Dash Filter requires that the PS Drive provider and the underlying technology, such as the file system, to support filtering. Dash Include does most of the work in the commandlet, so it doesn't necessarily need special support from the underlying technology although, as a result, it can be slower than dash filter. Now, as you might expect, this command will take a while to run, so we'll skip ahead to the opposite, which is the exclude parameter. Same idea, but this time it'll list everything except those files which match my criteria. This will also take a while to run. As I said, though, this isn't relying on the PS Drive provider, which means if we change to the registry, I can use include inside the registry, even though I couldn't use dash filter. So you do have options for trimming down what you see in the registry. Other commandlets support include and exclude too. For example, here's get service, which supports include to restrict the services return to just those which match the criteria you've specified. Now you have to ask, how would I have found out about filter, include, and exclude on my own? Well, look, I'm not a genius and I haven't memorized all this stuff. I just read the help files in Windows PowerShell. I recommend that you read the help file for every commandlet you use, even if it's a commandlet you've used a hundred times already. The help contains everything the commandlet can do, and you're going to find out about a lot of hidden functionality that maybe other folks don't know about. Here's an example, convert to HTML. This is one of my favorite commandlets, and you're going to see some really cool stuff that it can do. The convert to HTML commandlet is a great example of why it's so good to read the help. Let's look at a very simple usage of this commandlet. I'll get my computer's services, select just their name, status, and display name properties, convert that to an HTML table, and save the result in a file. Here's that HTML file displayed in a web browser. It's not too fancy, but it's got the information I wanted. It'd be very easy to assume that this was all convert to HTML could do. And that's why reading the help is so important. You find out a lot more about what commandlets can do. So that's some pretty plain HTML. And that's the deal here. Convert to HTML produces what we call clean HTML. Not a lot of formatting. Of course, not a lot of formatting means it kind of looks kind of plain. So formatting isn't supposed to be added into HTML code. Instead, what you're supposed to do is create a cascading style sheet, or CSS. You would then use parameters of convert to HTML to link or insert or attach that CSS to the HTML. This produces the cool formatted HTML tables and everything, and that is what gives you the great looking HTML reports you might have been looking for. If I create a cascading style sheet which specifies the formatting I want, I can link that to the HTML created by convert to HTML. I'll retrieve all of the services and export them to HTML. I'm specifying a title tag for the HTML, and I'm specifying a CSS style sheet link in the head section of the HTML. I'll save that all out to a file. Now let's look at that in Internet Explorer. I've made sure that my style sheet is in the same folder as the HTML file, because that's where the path in my style sheet link tells the browser to look. As you can see, the browser read my HTML file, saw the style sheet link, opened the style sheet and applied its formatting to my HTML. So convert to HTML can produce formatted output if you spend some time understanding how to really use the commandlet rather than just running it without any options. Pause this video and use your lab guide to complete the tasks in the lab. 
When you're finished, resume playing the video and I'll walk you through a sample solution. Let's see how you did with Lab 1-1. For Task 1, I asked for a directory of the System32 folder and specified a filter of star.dll. That gave me a list of just the DLL files in that folder. For Task 2, I'm using getWMIObject to retrieve the Win32 logical disk class. I'm filtering so that only those objects with a drive type property equal to 3 are included, and of those, I'm selecting just the device ID and free space properties, a quick free space report of local drives. For task 3, I'm using get process to retrieve process objects, and then converting them to an HTML table. I've used options of convert to HTML to specify additional text for the body of the file, as well as a title for the file. If we view the output in a browser, you can see that the window title is what I've specified, and the additional text I specified is in the body of the page. For task 4, I'm retrieving all processes and just selecting their name. I'm also using the unique parameter to ensure that I only see unique process names. Processes like service host will only show up once, even though there are multiple processes running with that name. Again, you would have needed to read the help on select object to find this parameter. Finally, in task 5, I'm using getWMIObject again, filtering my Win32 logical disk instances just for local drives. I'm piping those to the ForEachObject commandlet, and again using some functionality of that commandlet we haven't previously explored. I've specified code to run before any of the pipeline objects are processed, code to run when they've all been processed, and finally the code to run for each of them. The result is a header and footer on my final output. This is especially impressive if you can run it on a computer with multiple hard disks. You'll really see the difference between those begin, process, and end blocks.